Hello friends, I welcome you to the continuation in this calm reading of Little Women. Tonight I shall be reading for you chapter 35, Heartache, as well as chapter 36, Beth's Secret. It is time to unwind. Let's settle into a tranquil place. Make yourself comfortable, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and feel yourself relax. And let's begin these chapters. Chapter 35 Heartache Whatever his motive might have been, Lori studied to some purpose that year, for he graduated with honor and gave the Latin oration with the grace of a Philips and the eloquence of a Demosthenes, so his friends said. They were all there, his grandfather, oh so proud, Mr. and Mrs. March, John and Meg, Joe and Beth, and all exulted over him with the sincere admiration which boys make light of at the time, but fail to win from the world by any after triumphs. I've got to stay for this confounded supper, but I shall be home early tomorrow. You'll come and meet me as usual, girls, Lori said as he put the sisters into the carriage after the joys of the day were over. He said, girls, but he meant Joe, for she was the only one who kept up the old custom. She had not the heart to refuse her splendid, successful boy anything, and answered warmly. I'll come, Teddy, rain or shine, and march before you, playing Hail the Conquering Hero Comes, on the Jew's harp. Laurie thanked her with a look that made her think in a sudden panic. Oh, dear me, I know he'll say something, and then what shall I do? Evening meditation and morning work somewhat allayed her fears. And, having decided that she wouldn't be vain enough to think people were going to propose when she had given them every reason to know what her answer would be, she set forth at the appointed time, hoping Teddy wouldn't do anything to make her hurt his poor feelings. A call at Meg's and a refreshing sniff and sip at the Daisy and Demijohn still further fortified her for the tete-a-tete. -tete. But when she saw a stalwart figure looming in the distance, she had a strong desire to turn about and run away. Where's the juice harp, Joe? cried Laurie, as soon as he was within speaking distance. I forgot it. And Joe took heart again, for that salutation could not be called lover-like. She always used to take his arm on these occasions. Now she did not, and he made no complaint, which was a bad sign but talked on rapidly about all sorts of faraway subjects, till they turned from the road into a little path that led homeward through the grove. When he walked more slowly, suddenly lost his fine flow of language, and now and then a dreadful pause occurred. To rescue the conversation from one of the wells of silence into which it kept falling, Joe said hastily, now you must have a good long holiday. I intend to. Something in his resolute tone made Joe look up quickly to find him looking down at her with an expression that assured her the dreaded moment had come, and made her put out her hand with an imploring, No, Teddy, please don't. I will, and you must hear me. It's no use, Joe. We've got to have it out and the sooner the better for both of us, he answered, getting flushed and excited all at once. Say what you like, then, I'll listen, said Joe, 
with a desperate sort of patience. Mallory was a young lover, but he was in earnest and meant to have it out if he died in the attempt. So he plunged into the subject with characteristic impetuosity, saying in a voice that would get choky now and then, in spite of manful efforts to keep it steady. I've loved you ever since I've known you, Joe. Couldn't help it. You've been so good to me. I've tried to show it, but you wouldn't let me. Now I'm going to make you hear, and give me an answer, for I can't go on so any longer. I wanted to save you this. I thought you'd understand, began Joe, finding it a great deal harder than she expected. I know you did, but the girls are so queer and you never know what they mean. They say no when they mean yes, and drive a man out of his wits just for the fun of it, returned Laurie, entrenching himself behind an undeniable fact. I don't, I never want to make you care for me so, and I went away to keep you from it, if I could. I thought so. It was like you, but it was no use. I only loved you all the more, and I worked hard to please you. And I gave up billiards. And everything you didn't like, and waited and never complained. For I hoped you'd love me, though I'm not half good enough. Here, there was a joke that couldn't be controlled. So he decapitated buttercups, while he cleared his confounded throat. You, you are, you're a great deal too good for me, and I'm so grateful to you, and so proud and fond of you. I don't know why I can't love you as you want me to. I've tried, but I can't change the feeling, and it would be a lie to say I do when I don't. Really, truly, Joe? He stopped short and caught both her hands as he put his question with a look that she did not soon forget. Really, truly, dear. They were in the grove now, close by the stile, and when the last words fell reluctantly from Joe's lips, Lloyd dropped her hands and turned as if to go on. But for once in his life, the fence was too much for him. So he just laid his head down on the mossy post, and stood so still that Joe was frightened. Oh, Teddy, I'm sorry, so desperately sorry. I could kill myself if it would do any good. I wish you wouldn't take it so hard. I can't help it. You know it's impossible for people to make themselves love other people if they don't, cried Joe, inelegantly but remorsefully, as she softly patted his shoulder, remembering the time when he had comforted her so long ago. They do sometimes, said a muffled voice from the post. I don't believe it's the right sort of love, and I'd rather not try it was the decided answer. And there was a long pause, while the blackbird sung blithely on the willow by the river, and the tall grass rustled in the wind. Presently, Joe said very soberly, as she sat down on the step of the stile, Laurie, I want to tell you something. He started as if he had been shot threw up his head and cried out in a fierce tone. Don't tell me that, Joe. I can't bear it now. Tell what? she asked, wondering at his violence. That you love that old man. What old man? demanded Joe, thinking he must mean his grandfather. That devilish professor you were always writing about. If you say you love him, I know I shall do something desperate and it looked as if he would keep his word as he clenched his hands with a wrathful spark in his eyes. Joe wanted to laugh, 
but restrained herself and said warmly, for she too was getting excited with all this. Don't swear, Teddy, he isn't old, nor anything bad, but good and kind, and the best friend I've got next to you. Pray, don't fly into a passion. I want to be kind, but I know I shall get angry if you abuse my professor. I haven't the least idea of loving him or anybody else. But you will, after a while, and then what will become of me? You'll love someone else too, like a sensible boy, and forget all this trouble. I can't love someone else, and I'll never forget you, Joe. Never, never with a stamp to emphasize his passionate words. What shall I do with him? sighed Joe, finding that emotions were more unmanageable than she expected. You haven't heard what I wanted to tell you. Sit down and listen, for indeed I want to do right and make you happy, she said, hoping to soothe him with a little reason, which proved that she knew nothing about love. Seeing a ray of hope in that last speech, Laurie threw himself down on the grass at her feet, leaned his arm on the lower step of the stile, and looked up at her with an expectant face. Now that arrangement was not conducive to calm speech or clear thought on Joe's part for how could she say hard things to her boy while he watched her with eyes full of love and longing? And lashes, still wet with the bitter drop or two her hardness of heart had wrung from him. She gently turned his head away, saying, as she stroked the wavy hair which had been allowed to grow for her sake, how touching that was, to be sure. I agree with mother that you and I are not suited to each other, because our quick tempers and strong wills would probably make us very miserable if we were so foolish as to... Joe passed a little over the last word, but Laurie uttered it with a rapturous expression. Mary, no, we shouldn't. If you loved me, Joe, I should be a perfect saint for you could make me anything you like. No, I can't. I've tried and failed, and I won't risk our happiness by such a serious experiment. We don't agree, and we never shall. So we'll be good friends all our lives, but we don't go and do anything rash. Yes, we will if we get the chance, muttered Laurie rebelliously. Now do be reasonable, and take a sensible view of the case, implored Joe, almost at her wit's end. I won't be reasonable. I don't want to take what you call a sensible view. It won't help me, and it only makes it harder. I don't believe you've got any heart. I wish I hadn't. There was a little quiver in Joe's voice, and thinking it a good omen. Glory turned round, bringing all his persuasive powers to bear, as he said, in the wheedlesome tone that had never been so dangerously wheedlesome before. Don't disappoint us, dear. Everyone expects it. Grandpa has set his heart upon it. Your people like it. And I can get on without you. Say you will. And let's be happy. Do, do. Not until months afterward did Joe understand how she had the strength of mind to hold fast to the resolution she had made when she decided that she did not love her boy, and never could. It was very hard to do, but she did it, knowing that delay was both useless and cruel. I can't say yes, truly, so I won't say it at all. You'll see that I'm right by and by, and thank me for it, she began solemnly. I'll be hanged if I do, and Laurie bounced up off the grass, burning with indignation at the very idea. Yes, you will, 
persisted Joe. You'll get over this after a while and find some lovely accomplished girl who will adore you and make a fine mistress for your fine house. I shouldn't. I'm homely and awkward and odd and old, and you'll be ashamed of me, and we should quarrel. We can't help it even now, you see, and I shouldn't like elegant society, and you would. And you'd hate my scribbling, and I couldn't get on without it. And we should be unhappy, and wish we hadn't done it. And everything would be horrid. Anything more? asked Laurie, finding it hard to listen patiently to this prophetic burst. Nothing more, except that I don't believe I shall ever marry. I'm happy as I am, and I love my liberty too well to be in a hurry to give it up for any mortal man. I know better, broke in Laurie. You think so now but there'll come a time when you will care for somebody, and you'll love him tremendously, and live and die for him. I know you will. It's your way, and I shall have to stand by and see it. And the despairing lover cast his hat upon the ground with a gesture that would have seemed comical if his face had not been so tragic. Yes, I will live and die for him if he ever comes and makes me love him in spite of myself. And you must do the best you can, cried Joe, losing patience with poor Teddy. I've done my best, but you won't be reasonable, and it's selfish of you to keep teasing for what I can't give. I shall always be fond of you, very fond indeed, as a friend, but I'll never marry you and the sooner you believe it, the better for both of us. So now. That speech was like gunpowder. Laurie looked at her a minute, as if he did not quite know what to do with himself, then turned sharply away, saying in a desperate sort of tone, You'll be sorry some day, Joe. Oh, where are you going? she cried, for his face frightened her. To the devil, was the consoling answer. For a minute Joe's heart stood still, as he swung himself down the bank toward the river. But it takes much folly, sin or misery, to send a young man to a violent death. And Laurie was not one of the weak sort who are conquered by a single failure. He had no thought of a melodramatic plunge, but some blind instinct led him to fling hat and coat into his boat, and row away with all his might, making better time up the river than he had done in any race. Joe drew a long breath and unclasped her hands, as she watched the poor fellow trying to outstrip the trouble which he carried in his heart. That will do him good, and he'll come home in such a tender, penitent state of mind that I shan't dare to see him, she said, adding, as she went slowly home, feeling as if she had murdered some innocent thing and buried it under the leaves. Now I must go and prepare Mr. Lawrence to be very kind to my poor boy. I wish he'd love Beth, perhaps he may in time but I begin to think I was mistaken about her. Oh, dear. How can girls like to have lovers and refuse them? I think it's dreadful. Being sure that no one could do it so well as herself, she went straight to Mr. Lawrence, told the hard story bravely through, and then broke down, crying so dismally over her own insensibility that the kind old gentleman, though sorely disappointed, did not utter a reproach. He found it difficult to understand how any girl could help loving Glory, and hoped she would change her mind, but he knew even better than Joe that love cannot be forced. So he shook his head sadly and resolved to carry his boy out of harm's way. For young impetuosity's parting words to Joe disturbed him more than he would confess. When Laurie came home, 
dead tired but quite composed. His grandfather met him as if he knew nothing, and kept up the delusion very successfully for an hour or two. But when they sat together in the twilight, the time they used to enjoy so much, it was hard work for the old man to ramble on as usual, and harder still for the young one to listen to praise of the last year's success, which to him now seemed like love's labor lost. He bore it as long as he could, and then went to his piano and began to play. The windows were open, and Joe, walking in the garden with Beth, for once understood music better than her sister for he played the sonata pathétique, and played it as he never did before. That's very fine, I dare say, but it's sad enough to make one cry. Give us something gayer, lad, said Mr. Lawrence, whose kind old heart was full of sympathy, which he longed to show but knew not how. Glory dashed into a livery strain, played stormily for several minutes, and would have got through bravely if, in a momentary lull, Mrs. March's voice had not been heard calling, Joe, dear, come in, I want you. Just what Laurie longed to say, with a different meaning. As he listened, he lost his place. The music ended with a broken chord. And the musician sat silent in the dark. I can't understand this, muttered the old gentleman. Up he got, groped his way to the piano, laid a kind hand on either of the broad shoulders, and said, as gently as a woman, I know, my boy, I know. No answer for an instant. Then Laurie asked sharply, Who told you? Joe herself. Then there's an end of it. And he shook off his grandfather's hands with an impatient motion. For though grateful for the sympathy, his man's pride could not bear a man's pity. Not quite. I want to say one thing, and then there shall be an end of it, returned Mr. Lawrence with unusual mildness. You won't care to stay at home now, perhaps? I don't intend to run away from a girl. Joe can't prevent my seeing her, and I shall stay to do it as long as I like, interrupted Laurie in a defiant tone. Not if you are the gentleman, I think you. I'm disappointed, but the girl can't help it, and the only thing left for you to do is to go away for a time. Where will you go? Anywhere. I don't care what becomes of me, and Lori got up with a reckless laugh that grated on his grandfather's ear. Take it like a man, and don't do anything rash, for God's sake. Why not go abroad, as you planned, and forget it? I can't. But you've been wild to go, and I promised you should go when you got through college. Ah, but I didn't mean to go alone and Lori walked fast through the room with an expression which it was well his grandfather did not see. I don't ask you to go alone. There's someone ready and glad to go with you, anywhere in the world. Who, sir? Stopping to listen. Myself. Lori came back as quickly as he went, and put out his hand, saying huskily, I am a selfish brute, but... You know, grandfather. Lord help me, yes, I do know, for I've been through it all before, once in my own young days, and then with your father. Now, my dear boy, just sit quietly down and hear my plan. It's all settled, and can be carried out at once, said Mr. Lawrence, keeping hold of the young man, as if fearful that he would break away as his father had done before him. Well, sir, what is it? And Laurie sat down, without a sign of interest in face or voice. There is a business in London that needs looking after. 
I meant you should attend to it, but I can do it better myself, and things here will get on very well with Brook to manage them. My partners do almost everything. I'm merely holding on until you take my place, and can be off at any time. But you hate traveling, sir. I can't ask it off you at your age, began Laurie, who was grateful for the sacrifice but much prefer to go alone if he went at all. The old gentleman knew that perfectly well, and particularly desired to prevent it, for the mood in which he found his grandson assured him that it would not be wise to leave him to his own devices. So, stifling a natural regret at the thought of the home comforts he would leave behind him, he said stoutly, Bless your soul. I'm not superannuated yet. I quite enjoy the idea. It will do me good, and my old bones won't suffer, for traveling nowadays is almost as easy as sitting in a chair. A restless movement from Laurie suggested that his chair was not easy, or that he did not like the plan, and made the old man add hastily. I don't mean to be a marplot or a burden. I go because I think you'd feel happier than if I was left behind. I don't intend to gad about with you, but leave you free to go where you like, while I amuse myself in my own way. I have friends in London and Paris, and should like to visit them. Meantime, you go to Italy, Germany, Switzerland, where you will, and enjoy pictures, music, scenery, and adventures to your heart's content. Now Lori felt just then that his heart was entirely broken and the world a howling wilderness. But at the sound of certain words which the old gentleman artfully introduced into the closing sentence, the broken heart gave an unexpected leap, and a green oasis or two suddenly appeared in the howling wilderness. He sighed and then said in a spiritless tone, just as you like, sir. It doesn't matter where I go or what I do. It does to me. Remember that, my lad. I give you entire liberty, but I trust you to make an honest use of it. Promise me that, Laurie. Anything you like, sir. Good, thought the old gentleman. You don't care now, but there'll come a time when that promise will keep you out of mischief. or. I'm much mistaken. Being an energetic individual, Mr. Lawrence struck while the iron was hot, and before the blighted being recovered spirit enough to rebel, they were off. During the time necessary for preparation, Laurie bore himself as young gentlemen usually do in such cases. He was moody, irritable, and pensive by turns lost his appetite, neglected his dress, and devoted much time to playing tempestuously on his piano, avoided Joe, but consoled himself by staring at her from his window, with the tragic face that haunted her dreams by night, and oppressed her with a heavy sense of guilt by day. Unlike some sufferers, he never spoke of his unrequited passion, and would allow no one not even Mrs. March, to attempt consolation or offer sympathy. On some accounts, this was a relief to his friends. But the weeks before his departure were very uncomfortable, and everyone rejoiced that the poor dear fellow was going away to forget his trouble and come home happy. Of course, he smiled darkly at their delusion but passed it by with the sad superiority of one who knew that his fidelity, like his love, was unalterable. When the parting came, he affected high spirits to conceal certain inconvenient emotions, which seemed inclined to assert themselves. This gaiety did not impose upon anybody, but they tried to look as if it did for his sake and he got on very well till Mrs. March kissed him, with a whisper full of motherly solicitude. Then, feeling that he was going very fast, 
he hastily embraced them all round, not forgetting the afflicted Hana, and ran downstairs as if for his life. Joe followed a minute after to wave a hand to him if he looked round. He did look round, came back, put his arms about her as she stood on the step above him, and looked up at her with a face that made his short appeal eloquent and pathetic. Oh, Joe, can't you? Teddy, dear, I wish I could. That was all, except a little pause. Then Laurie straightened himself up, said, It's all right, never mind, and went away without another word. Ah, but it wasn't all right, and Joe did mind, for while the curly head lay on her arm a minute after her hard answer, she felt as if she had stabbed her dearest friend. And when he left her without a look behind him, she knew that the boy Laurie never would come again. Chapter 36 Beth's Secret When Joe came home that spring, she had been struck with the change in Beth. No one spoke of it or seemed aware of it for it had come too gradually to startle those who saw her daily. But to eyes sharpened by absence, it was very plain, and a heavy weight fell on Joe's heart, as she saw her sister's face. It was no paler and but little thinner than in the autumn, yet there was a strange, transparent look about it, as if the mortal was being slowly refined away, and the immortal shining through the frail flesh with an indescribably pathetic beauty. Joe saw and felt it, but said nothing at the time, and soon the first impression lost much of its power, for Beth seemed happy, no one appeared to doubt that she was better, and presently in other cares, Joe for a time forgot her fear. But when Laurie was gone, and peace prevailed again, the vague anxiety returned and haunted her. She had confessed her sins and been forgiven. But when she showed her savings and proposed a mountain trip, Beth had thanked her heartily, but begged not to go so far away from home. Another little visit to the seashore would suit her better, and as Grandma could not be prevailed upon to leave the babies, Joe took Beth down to the quiet place, where she could live much in the open air and let the fresh sea breeze blow a little color into her pale cheeks. It was not a fashionable place, but when among the pleasant people there, the girls made few friends, preferring to live for one another. Beth was too shy to enjoy society, and Joe too wrapped up in her to care for anyone else. So they were, all in all, to each other. And came and went, quite unconscious of the interest they excited in those about them, who watched with sympathetic eyes the strong sister and the feeble one, always together, as if they felt instinctively that the long separation was not far away. They did feel it, yet neither spoke of it, for often between ourselves and those nearest and dearest to us, there exists a reserve which it is very hard to overcome. Joe felt as if a veil had fallen between her heart and Beth's. But when she put out her hand to lift it up, there seemed something sacred in the silence, and she waited for Beth to speak. She wondered and was thankful also that her parents did not seem to see what she saw and during the quiet weeks when the shadows grew so plain to her, she said nothing of it to those at home, believing that it would tell itself when Beth came back no better. She wondered still more if her sister really guessed the hard truth, and what thoughts were passing through her mind during the long hours when she lay on the warm rocks with her head on Joe's lap, while the winds blew healthfully over her, 
and the sea made music at her feet. One day Beth told her. Joe thought she was asleep. She lay so still, and putting down her book, sat looking at her with wistful eyes, trying to see signs of hope in the faint color on Beth's cheeks. But she could not find enough to satisfy her, for the cheeks were thin, and the hands seemed too feeble to hold even the rosy little shells they had been collecting. It came to her then more bitterly than ever that Beth was slowly drifting away from her, and her arms instinctively tightened her hold upon the dearest treasure she possessed. For a minute her eyes were too dim for seeing, and when they cleared, Beth was looking up at her so tenderly that there was hardly any need for her to say, Joe, dear, I am glad you know it. I've tried to tell you, but I couldn't. There was no answer, except her sister's cheek against her own, not even tears, for when most deeply moved, Joe did not cry. She was the weaker then, and Beth tried to comfort and sustain her, with the arms about her and the soothing words she whispered in her ear. I've known it for a good while, dear, and now I'm used to it. It isn't hard to think of or to bear. Try to see it so, and don't be troubled about me, because it's best. Indeed, it is. Is this what made you so unhappy in the autumn, Beth? You did not feel it then, and kept it to yourself so long, did you? Asked Joe, refusing to see or say that it was best but glad to know that Laurie had no part in Beth's trouble. Yes, I gave up hoping then, but I didn't like to own it. I tried to think it was a sick fancy, and would not let it trouble me. But when I saw you all so well and strong and full of happy plans, it was hard to feel that I could never be like you. And then I was miserable, Joe. Oh, Beth, and you didn't tell me, didn't let me comfort and help you. How could you shut me out, bear it all alone? Joe's voice was full of tender reproach, and her heart ached to think of the solitary struggle that must have gone on while Beth learned to say goodbye to health, love, and life, and take up her cross so cheerfully. Perhaps it was wrong, but I tried to do right. I wasn't sure. No one said anything, and I hoped I was mistaken. It would have been selfish to frighten you all when Marmy was so anxious about Meg, and Amy away, and you so happy with Laurie. At least I thought so then. And I thought you loved him, Beth, and I went away because I couldn't, cried Joe glad to say all the truth. Beth looked so amazed at the idea that Joe smiled in spite of her pain and added softly, Then you didn't, dearie. I was afraid it was so, and imagined your poor little heart full of lovelornity all that while. Why, Joe, how could I, when he was so fond of you? asked Beth as innocently as a child. I do love him dearly. He is so good to me. How can I help it? But he could never be anything to me but my brother. I hope he truly will be sometime. Not through me, said Joe decidedly. Amy is left for him, and they would suit excellently, but I have no heart for such things now. I don't care what becomes of anybody but you, Beth. You must get well. I want to, oh, so much. I try, but every day I lose a little, and feel more sure that I shall never gain it back. It's like the tide, Joe, when it turns. It goes slowly, but it can't be stopped. It shall be stopped. Your tide must not turn so soon. Nineteen is too young, Beth. I can't let you go. 
I'll work and pray and fight against it. I'll keep you in spite of everything. There must be ways. It can't be too late. God won't be so cruel as to take you from me, cried poor Joe rebelliously, for her spirit was far less piously submissive than Beth's. Simple, sincere people seldom speak much of their piety. It shows itself in acts rather than in words, and has more influence than homilies or protestations. Beth could not reason upon or explain the faith that gave her courage and patience to give up life and cheerfully wait for death. Like a confiding child, she asked no questions, but left everything to God and nature, father and mother of us all, feeling sure that they, and they only, could teach and strengthen heart and spirit for this life and the life to come. She did not rebuke Joe with saintly speeches, only loved her better for her passionate affection, and clung more closely to the dear human love from which our Father never means us to be weaned, but through which he draws us closer to himself. She could not say, I am glad to go, for life was very sweet for her. She could only sob out. I try to be willing, while she held fast to Joe, as the first bitter wave of this great sorrow broke over them together. By and by Beth said, with recovered serenity, You'll tell them with this when we go home. I think they will see it without words, sighed Joe, for now it seemed to her that Beth changed every day. Perhaps not. I've heard that the people who love best are often blindest to such things. If they don't see it, you will tell them for me. I don't want any secrets, and it's kinder to prepare them. Meg has John and the babies to comfort her, but you must stand by father and mother, won't you, Joe? If I can, but, Beth, I don't give up yet. I'm going to believe that it is a sick fancy, and don't let you think it's true, said Joe, trying to speak cheerfully. Beth lay a minute, thinking, and then said in a quiet way, I don't know how to express myself, and shouldn't try to anyone but you, because I can't speak out except to my Joe. I only mean to say that I have a feeling that it never was intended I should live long. I'm not like the rest of you. I never made any plans about what I'd do when I grew up. I never thought of being married, as you all did. I couldn't seem to imagine myself anything but stupid little Beth trotting about the home, of no use anywhere but there. I never wanted to go away. And the hard part now is the leaving you all. I'm not afraid, but it seems as if I should be homesick for you even in heaven. Joe could not speak, and for several minutes there was no sound but the sigh of the wind and the lapping of the tide. A white-winged gull flew by, with the flash of sunshine on its silvery breast. Beth watched it till it vanished, and her eyes were full of sadness. A little, grey-coated sandbird came tripping over the beach, peeping softly to itself, as if enjoying the sun and sea. It came quite close to Beth, and looking at her with a friendly eye, and sat upon a warm stone, dressing its wet feathers quite at home. Beth smiled and felt comforted, for the tiny thing seemed to offer its small friendship, and reminded her that a pleasant world was still to be enjoyed. Dear little bird, see, Joe, how tame it is. I like peeps better than the gulls. They are not so wild and handsome, but they seem happy, confiding little things. I used to call them my birds last summer, and Mother said they remind her of me, busy, Quaker-colored creatures, always near the shore, and always chirping, that contented little song of theirs. You are the gull, Joe, 
strong and wild, fond of the storm and the wind, flying far out to sea and happy all alone. Meg is the turtle dove, and Amy is like the lark she writes about, trying to get up among the clouds, but always dropping down into its nest again. Dear little girl, she's so ambitious, but her heart is good and tender, and no matter how high she flies, she never will forget home. I hope I shall see her again, but it seems so far away. She is coming in the spring, and I mean that you shall be all ready to see and enjoy her. I'm going to have you well and rosy by that time, began Joe, feeling that all of the changes in Beth, their talking change, was the greatest, for it seemed to cost no effort now, and she thought aloud in a way quite unlike bashful Beth. Joe, dear, don't hope any more. It won't do any good. I'm sure of that. We won't be miserable, but enjoy being together while we wait. We'll have happy times, for I don't suffer much, and I think the tide will go out easily, if you help me. Joe leaned down to kiss the tranquil face, and with that silent kiss, she dedicated herself, soul and body, to Beth. She was right, and there was no need of any words when they got home for father and mother saw plainly now what they had prayed to be saved from seeing. Tired with a short journey, Beth went at once to bed, saying how glad she was to be home, and when Joe went down, she found that she would be spared the hard task of telling Beth's secret. Her father stood leaning his head on the mantelpiece, and did not turn as she came in. But her mother stretched out her arms as if for help, and Joe went to comfort her without a word.